guys. We are reading The Coffin Quilt by Ann Rinaldi. And um, I'm sorry I wasn't able to go live yesterday. Life happened. So I'm here today. We're going to start on page 168, chapter 27. Um, if you remember that Fanny's brothers were killed. And so um, in the last few chapters, she explained how it was affecting the family. And she's particularly worried about Bill. So we are going to start with chapter 27, the winter of 1883 on page 168, if you'd like to join. Yesterday a funeral, and today a wedding. That's what I thought watching Trin Villa stand in church beside Will Thompson while his father asked her, will thou take this man? Yesterday, the same people standing in church, blowing on their hands for the cold, in spite of the warmth from the old pot stove, had stood, stamping their feet at the cemetery at the mouth of Peter Creek, while Reverend Thompson prayed over another McCoy, ambushed by Hatfields, a distant kin. So she's not talking about her brother's funerals. She's talking about another McCoy who... Um, was ambushed by Hatfields. So it's supposed to show you how the feud is continuing. As Trinvilla answered yes, two men stood guard with long rifles outside the small church. Yesterday, McCoys were so armed at the cemetery it looked like they were expecting General Grant and his army, but with good reason. While Reverend Thompson had prayed over the casket, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, we could see Hatfields gathered all in a row on horses across the tug. Pa expected them to fire their high-powered Winchester rifles across the water at us at any minute. After the funeral, Reverend Thompson came over to Pa. I'm a man of the Lord, Renell. I have to stay out of this fight. If the Hatfields need me to bury any of their dead, I must do it. It's all right, Pa had said. Just pray over our dead and marry our children. It was two days into the new year when Trinvilla wed, cold as the inside of the devil's ear. We tramped back to the house in the snow, and even though the men were all armed, there was a mood of merriment. Back at the house, my brother Floyd broke out the rums. Bill, looking pale and thin, started his fiddle music. The parlor had been cleared of furniture for dancing. The kitchen was full of people and good smells. In the upstairs bedroom that Trinvilla shared with Adelaide and Alifair, I watched as Adelaide helped my sister pack her things. Baltimore, Adelaide said. What I'd give to see Baltimore. It isn't as if we're staying at any fancy hotel, Trinvilla said. We'll be guests at Will's aunt and uncle's home. But it is grand, I hear. But think, you wed going away with a man? Adelaide was starry-eyed. Trinvilla laughed. I feel the fine lady in this dress Ma made. Do I look it? You look finer than anybody. They'll love you in Baltimore, Adelaide told her. There, you're all packed. I've got to go downstairs and help Alifair with the food. Left alone with Trinvilla, I did not know what to say. I think she felt the same way. She sat down on her bed and smiled at me. Adelaide won't marry, she said. So you're next, Fanny. I shook my head no. I'm only 11. Time to start making her wedding ring quilt. I had my eye on Will since I was 10. She was just 16. You're so grown up, Trinvilla, I said. How come you never call me 20 like the others? I blushed. We were never close. You were always on the side of Alifair. I went along with her because I wasn't strong enough to say no. I saw how she treated you. I'm sorry for that, Fanny. But you stood up to her always. I thought that was right fine. My eyes widened. You did? Yes. Now listen, I'm going away. It's time to say some things. I don't know if we'll stay in Baltimore if we'll come back here, but if we do, we'll move more inland. 
You know the governors of both states are telling people to move more inland to get away from the fighting. I nodded yes. Jim is thinking on it. And Calvin is trying to make Ma and Pa move, but they won't hear of it. Ma told Calvin the only way they'll get her out of this house is to carry her out. They like it, Fanny, all the fighting. Do you know what first drew me to Will Thompson? He's like his pa. He wants no part of it. Around here, you have to be either for the Hatfields or the McCoys. You have to choose sides. Well, Will and I are staying out of it. I'm tired of it, Fanny. All the killing. When you cast an eye on a boy, be sure he's out of it. And when you wed, get away. Stay out of it, Fanny. Do, or it'll destroy you. I couldn't answer this outburst. Never did I expect it from Quiet Turn Villa. I love Ma and Pa, she said, but they're crazy. This whole family is. You know how Alifair acted with me when I got betrothed to Will? Like I betrayed her. Wouldn't help me with my wedding ring quilt. Wouldn't listen to me about my plans. Imagine. She expected me not to wed. To stay home and do her bidding. Well, she's got Adelaide as her indentured servant, but not me. I aim to make a life of my own. And not stay around here and wait for the next shooting and go to the next funeral and see Bill mourning at the grave and Calvin waiting to run out on the next raid. And Rosanna, looking like she should be in the grave. She stood up, smoothed her dress, and smiled. Enough, she said. If you ever get tired of it all, Fanny, you can come and live with us. Thank you, I said. Then I kissed her. I wish you well, Trinvilla. I do. She put her arm around me and we went downstairs. Afterward, I stood at the window as they drove off in the buggy to Will's father's for overnight. I never even knew my sister, I thought. And now I've lost her. For a day or so, I pondered what Trinvilla had said. I tried not to think of the feud. I didn't listen when Paul told how there was a $500,000 price on Devil Ants' head. Or when Calvin told how he'd met two detectives in Pikeville who were set on capturing Hatfields. Or when Adelaide said how Nancy and Johns had a baby boy. I tried to stay out of it. I tried to think about school. I was doing well in my son's geography, history, and English. I was getting so good at milking the cows that I could read while I did it. Just lay a book open on my lap. I read the book intended for Calvin and lost myself in Mr. Dickens' England at Christmas. I told nobody about Rosanna's quilt having our names on it. Rosanna left us right after the wedding and went to stay with Tolbert's Mary, who was thinking of moving back to Louisville where her parents lived. Winter closed in around us, bringing some heavy storms so that we had all we could do just to care for the animals, clear the yard, and get back and forth to school. One night the first week in February, after it had snowed a fine needle-like snow all day, I came back into the house for milking the cows, and Bill hadn't come home. It was now on to dark, Paul was tying a rope from the house to the barn to use for a guideline if more snow came. We had supper. Nothing was said about Bill. After I'd helped Adelaide and Alifair clean up, I put some food in a pot and started getting on my outside clothes. Where do you think you're going, Alifair demanded. To take Bill some food. In case you haven't noticed, he hasn't come home. You take off that coat. If you didn't spoil him so by bringing food up there, he might come home. You're not going out to slip into the ravine and nobody will know it. Besides, he's probably warm and cozy in a corn crib someplace. He's not stupid, even though he makes like he is. But he wants to die, I thought. You don't understand. Pa came in the door then, 
his hair and beard covered with ice. Your sister's right, he said. Bill can take care of himself, leave him be. His tone brooked no argument. You were just doing it to be mean, I told Alifair. That night, I was the last one to blow out the oil lamp in the kitchen and go up to bed. I waited and waited for Bill, torn between wanting to put on my coat and go fetch him and fear of what Pa would do if I went out and got lost in the snow. Bill, I thought, Bill, why don't you come home? Are you safe in a corn crib somewhere? Why wouldn't you ever take a gun with you like Paul and Calvin said so you don't get ambushed? I went to bed. Under my quilts, I listened to the howling wind, to the needle-like snow against the window. Once, I thought I heard something outside and got up to look out. There it was, eyes glowing, yellow-green, moving through the snow like it was summer wheat. I sat up half the night trembling and finally went to sleep. At dawn, the sun shone, sparkling on tree limbs and fence posts. After I milked the cows, I, went, I walked to Floyd's. He came with me up the hill to the cemetery. From halfway there, I saw the vultures and the naked trees overhead. Crows called. Everything echoed. Floyd told me to stay back. He'd go up. But I said no. Eyes coming too. And there at the graves, we found Bill. Frozen stiff with his fiddle in his hands. His eyelashes were crusted with snow. His face bluish white. Floyd had to carry me down the hill. I was so crazy with grief. Then go back up with Calvin and a sled to fetch Bill down.